Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Narayanam Namaskritya Naram Chaiva Narotamam Devim Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jayam Udiraye Thank you everyone for joining this morning. It's heartening to say the least to be together while driving here. I noticed people in a hurry, but I felt sorry that they were in a hurry to go to work at a job. Job stands for just over broke. Because <laughs> you can never get ahead in the material world. But you can get ahead in the spiritual world. And it's a simple process. It means to surrender, especially the hearing process in Krishna's service. And even if somebody is working and everyone has to work in the material world one way or another, by inserting this into one's life, then it opens a space for one to then become involved in service to Krishna. And then that Krishna, that service to Krishna becomes more and more prominent in one's life and it supplants all the other so-called duties that we have in relationship to the body. That takes time. Tavat karma na kurvita na nirvidyate yavata matkata shravana dova shodayavana jayate. 11th canto Srimad Bhagavatam says that one should develop this sense of faith in hearing that is the panacea and as one does to the degree that one does one can also then not be as involved in the material world until that time one has to maintain one's duties because it's uh, necessary to main maintain oneself and also we should set an example that by working in this world and at the same time performing Christian consciousness. Anyone can go through this life unscathed and people need to see examples of that as all of you are setting for the world. Hare Krishna. So we're setting upon this uh, journey to read the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And we've already, over the last few days, read several, ver several verses uh, beginning with the invocation, which is Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. And here, uh, Shukadeva Goswami is speaking to Maharaj Prikshit at the outset of his instructions to him. And we'll notice that he's dir very direct. I was going to say a little direct, but that sounds better. He was a little direct, then it sounds <laughs> even more direct, saying that he is very direct. Just consider who he is. Sri Giri Goswami is detached from the world. He doesn't care a fig. Why he doesn't care a fig? Because figs, fig trees are prolific. And if you try to sell a fig somewhere, it won't say, hey, I get that anywhere. It's not worth that much. He doesn't care a fig for anything in the material world. That's why he walks about naked. It's like, I really don't care. And he wants to point out to Prichit Maharaj at the outset of his teachings the futility of material life and also the ways in which one becomes entangled in material life and ultimately how one becomes unentangled by becoming entangled in Krishna's story, the story of Krishna. Who knew that just by hearing a story that one would become perfect and liberated. It sounds like a kindergartner's dream, as everyone likes to hear stories. So we can take 
pleasure in the lila of Krishna and at the same time advance towards the perfection of life. So we're going to start now uh, reading from Second Canto and uh, we'll take it up where we left off at verse number two. Shrotavya dini ranjindra nrinam santi sahasrashaha apashyatam atmatatvam griheshu griha medinam. Translation, please. Thank you. Those persons who are materially engrossed, being blind to the knowledge of ultimate truth, have many subject matters for hearing in human society, O Emperor. In the revealed scriptures, there are two nomenclatures for the householder's life. One is grahasta and the other is grihamati. The grahastas are those who live together with wife and children, but live transcendentally for realizing the ultimate truth. The grihamatis, however, are those who live only for the benefit of the family members, extended or centralized, and thus are envious of others. The word madhi indicates jealousy of others. The Grihamedis, being interested in family affairs only, are certainly envious of others. Therefore, one Grihamedhi is not on good, term, good terms with another Grihamedhi. And in the extended form, one community, society, or nation is not on good terms with another counterpart of selfish interest. In the age of Kali, all householders are jealous of one another because they are blind to the knowledge of the ultimate truth. They have many subject matters for hearing, political, scientific, social, economic, and so on. But due to a poor fund of knowledge, they set aside the question of the ultimate miseries of life, namely miseries of birth, death, old age, and disease. Factually, the human life is meant for making an ultimate solution to birth death, old age, and disease. But the Grihamedes, being illusioned by the material nature, forget everything about self-realization. The ultimate solution to the problems of life is to go back home, back to Godhead. And thus, as stated in the Bhagavad Gita 8.16, the miseries of material existence, birth, death, old age, and disease are removed. The process of going back home, back to Godhead, is to hear about the Supreme Lord and his name, form, attributes, pastimes, paraphernalia, and variegatedness. Foolish people do not know this. They want to hear something about the name, form, etc. of everything temporary, and they do not know how to utilize this propensity of hearing for the ultimate good. Misguided as they are, they also create some false literatures about the name, form, attributes, etc. of the absolute truth. One should not, therefore, become a Grihamedi simply to exist for envying others. One should become a real householder in terms of the scriptural injunctions. Text number three. Nidriyariyate naktam vyavayena chavavaya diva chartehaya rajan kutumba varaninava. The lifetime of such an envious householder is passed at night either in sleeping or in sex indulgence and in the daytime in, in either making money or maintaining family members. The present human civilization is primarily based on the principles of sleeping and sex indulgence at night and earning money in the day and spending the same for family maintenance. Such a form of human civilization is condemned by the Bhagavata school. Because human life is a combination of matter and spirit soul, the whole process of Vedic knowledge is directed at liberating the spirit soul from the contamination of matter. The knowledge concerning this is called Atma Tattva. Those men who are too materialistic are unaware of this knowledge and are more inclined to economic development for material enjoyment. Such materialistic men are called karmis or fruitive laborers and they are allowed regulated economic development or association of women for sex, sex indulgence. Those who are above the karmis, that is, the jnanis, yogis, and devotees, are strictly prohibited from sex indulgence. The karmis are more or less devoid of atma tattva knowledge, and as such, their life is spent without spiritual profit. The human life is not meant for hard labor, for economic 
development, nor is it meant for sex indulgence like that of the dogs and hogs. It is specially meant for making a solution to the problems of material life and the miseries thereof. So the karmis waste their valuable human life by sleeping and sex indulgence at night and by laboring hard in the daytime to accumulate wealth. And after doing that, they try to improve the standard of materialistic life. The materialistic way of life is described herein in a nutshell, and how foolishly men waste the boon of human life is described as follows. Deha patya kalata deshu apasainesha satsupi tesham pramato nidhanam pashyana pina pashyati tesham pramato nidhanam pashyana pina pashyati Persons devoid of atma-tattva do not inquire into the problems of life, being too attached to the fallible soldiers like the body, children, and wife. Although sufficiently experienced, they still do not see their inevitable destruction. This materialistic world is called the world of death. Every living being, beginning from Brahma, whose duration of life is some thousands of millions of years, down to the germs, who live for a few seconds only, is struggling for existence. Therefore, this life is a sort of fight with material nature, which imposes death upon all. In the human form of life, a living being is competent enough to come to an understanding of this great struggle for existence, but being too attached to family members, society, country, etc., he wants to win over the invincible material nature by the aid of bodily strength, children, wife, relatives, etc. Although he is sufficiently experienced in the matter by dint of past experience and previous examples of his deceased predecessors, he does not see that the so-called fighting soldiers like the children, relatives, society, members, and countrymen are all fallible in the great struggle. One should examine the fact that his father or his father's father has already died, and that he himself is therefore also sure to die, and similarly his children, who are the would-be fathers of their children, would also die in due course. No one will survive in this struggle with material nature. The history of human society definitely proves it, yet the foolish people still suggest that in the future they will be able to live perpetually with the help of material science. This poor fund of knowledge exhibited by human society is certainly misleading, and it is all due to ignoring the constitution of the living soul. This material world exists only as a dream due to our attachment to it. Otherwise, the living soul is always different from attachment to it, uh, different from the material nature. The great ocean of material nature is tossing with the waves of time, and the so-called living conditions are something like foaming bubbles, which appear before us as bodily self, wife, children, society, countrymen, etc. Due to a lack of knowledge of self, we become victimized by the force of ignorance and thus spoil the valuable energy of human life in a vain search after permanent living conditions which are impossible in this material world. Our friends, relatives, and so-called wives and children are not only fallible, but also bewildered by the outward glamour of material existence. As such, they cannot save us, since we think that we are safe within the orbit of family, society, and country. The whole materialistic advancement of human civilization is like the decoration of a dead body. Everyone is a dead body flapping only for a few days, and yet all the energy of human life is being wasted on the decoration of this dead body. Shukadev Goswami is pointing out the, the duty of the human being after showing the actual position of bewildered human activities. Persons who are devoid of the knowledge of, the, of Atma Tattva are misguided, but those who are devotees of the Lord and have perfect realization, transcendental, and who have perfect realization of transcendental knowledge, are not bewildered. Text five: Tasmat Bharata Sarvatma Bhagavan Ishvaro Harihi 
Shotavya Kirti Tavyascha Smarta Vyashchetabhayam. O descendant of King Bharat, one who desires to be free from all miseries must hear about, glorify, and also remember the personality of Godhead, who is the super soul, the controller, and the savior from all miseries. Purport. In the previous verse, Sri Shukadeva Goswami has described how the foolish, materially attached men are wasting their valuable time in the improvement of the material conditions of life by sleeping, indulging in sex life, developing economic conditions, and maintaining a band of relatives who are to be vanquished in the air of oblivion. Being engaged in all these materialistic activities, the living soul entangles himself in the cycle of the law of fruitive actions. This entails the chain of birth and death in the 8,400,000 species of life, the aquatics, the vegetables, the reptiles, the birds, the beasts, the uncivilized men, and then again the human form, which is the chance for getting out of the cycle of fruitive action. Therefore, if one desires freedom from this vicious cycle, then one must cease to act as a karmi or enjoyer of the results of one's own work, good or bad. One should not do anything, either good or bad, on his own account, but must execute everything on behalf of the Supreme Lord, the ultimate proprietor of everything that be. This process of doing work is recommended in the Bhagavad Gita 927. Also, where instruction is given for working on the Lord's account. Therefore, one should first of all hear about the Lord. When one has perfectly and scrutinizingly heard, one must glorify his acts and deeds, and thus it will be possible to remember constantly the transcendental nature of the Lord. Hearing about and glorifying the Lord are, are identical with the transcendental nature of the Lord, and by so doing, one will be always in the association of the Lord. This brings freedom from all sorts of fear. The Lord is the super soul, Paramatma, present in the hearts of all living beings. And thus, by the above hearing and glorifying process, the Lord invites the association of all in his creation. This process of hearing about and glorifying the Lord is applicable for everyone, whoever he may be, and it will lead one to the ultimate success in everything in which one may be engaged by providence. There are many classes of human beings, the fruit of workers, the empiric philosophers, the mystic yogis, and ultimately the unalloyed devotees. For all of them, one and the same process is applicable for achieving the desired success. Everyone wants to be free from all kinds of fear, and everyone wants the fullest extent of happiness in life. The perfect process for achieving this, here and now, is recommended in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is uttered by such a great authority as Srila Shukadeva Goswami. By hearing about and glorifying the Lord, all a person's activities become molded into spiritual activities, and thus all conceptions of material miseries become completely vanquished. Six. Itavan Sankya Yogyabyam Sudharma Parinishtaya Janmalabha Parapungsam Ante Narayani Ante Narayana Smritihi. The highest perfection of human life achieved either by complete knowledge of matter and spirit, by practice of mystic powers, or by perfect discharge of occupational duty is to remember the personality of Godhead at the end of life. Purport, Narayan is the transcendental personality of Godhead beyond the material creation. Everything that is created, sustained, and at the end annihilated is within the compass of the Mahatattva, material principle, and is known as the material world. The existence of Narayan, or the personality of Godhead, is not within the jurisdiction of this Mahatattva, and as such, the name, form, attributes, etc. of Narayan are beyond the jurisdiction of the material world. By the speculation of empiric philosophy, which discerns matter from spirit, or by cultivation of mystic powers, 
which ultimately helps the performer to reach any planet of the universe or beyond the universe, or by discharge of religious duties, one can achieve the highest perfection provided. One is able to reach the stage of Narayana Smriti, or constant um, remembrance of the Personality of Godhead. This is possible only by the association of a pure devotee who can give a finishing touch to the transcendental activities of all jnanis, yogis, and karmis, or karmis, in terms of prescribed duties defined in the scriptures. There are many historical instances of the achievement of spiritual perfection, such as that of the mm, Sanakadi Rishis, or the nine celebrated Yogendras, who attained perfection only after being situated in the devotional service of the Lord. None of the devotees of the Lord ever deviated from the path of devotional service by taking to other methods as adopted by the jnanis or yogis. Everyone is anxious to achieve the highest perfection of his particular activity, particular activity, and it is indicated herein that such perfection is Narayana Smriti, for which everyone must endeavor his best. In other words, life should be molded in such a manner that one is able to progressively remember the personality of Godhead in every step of life. Text 7. Prayina Muniya Rajan Nivrta Vitti Sedaya Sedataha Nargunya Sta Ramante Sma Gunanu Katane Hare. O King Parikshit, mainly the topmost transcendentalists who are above the regulative principles and restrictions, take pleasure in describing the glories of the Lord. Purport, the topmost transcendentalist is a liberated soul and is therefore not within the purview of the regulative principles. A neophyte who is intended to be promoted to the spiritual plane is guided by the spiritual master under regulative principles. Regulative principles. He must be compared to a patient who is treated. He may be compared to a patient who is treated by various restrictions under medical jurisdiction. Generally liberated souls also take pleasure in describing the transcendental activities. As mentioned above, since Narayan, Hari, the personality of God, it is beyond the material creation. His form and attributes are not material. The topmost transcendentalists or the liberated souls realize him by advanced experience of transcendental knowledge. And therefore, they take pleasure in the discussion of the transcendental qualities of the Lord's pastimes. In the Bhagavad Gita 4.9, the personality of Godhead declares, that his appearance and activities are all divyam, or transcendental. The common man who is under the spell of material energy takes it for granted that the Lord is like one of us, and therefore he refuses to accept the transcendental nature of the Lord's form, name, etc. The topmost transcendentalist is not interested in anything material and is taking interest in the matter of the Lord's activities is definite proof that the Lord is not like one of us in the material world. In the Vedic literatures also, it is confirmed that the Supreme Lord is one, but that he is engaged in his transcendental pastimes in the company of his unalloyed devotees, and that simultaneously he is present as the Supersoul, an expansion of Baladev in the heart of all living entities. Therefore, the highest perfection of transcendental realization is to take pleasure in hearing and describing the transcendental qualities of the Lord and not in merging into his impersonal Brahman existence for which the impersonalist monist aspires. Real transcendental pleasure is realized in the glorification of the transcendental Lord and not in the feeling of being situated in his impersonal feature. But there are also others who are not the topmost transcendentalists, but are in a lower status, and who do not take pleasure in describing the transcendental activities of the Lord. 
Rather, they discuss such activities of the Lord formally with the aim of merging into his existence. How is everyone? Better than good. Okay. Let's just, I just want to see who's online, so just click to the Zoom room for a second. Hare Krishna. Haribo! Everyone okay? Better than okay. Couldn't be better situated. All right, let's go back to the text at hand. Here we are in text eight. We're associating now with Shukadeva Goswami directly. Idam Bhagavatam Nama Puranam Brahmasanghitam Aditavan Dwaparya Dao Pitur Dai Pa Yanad Aham. At the end of the Dwapara Yuga, I studied this great supplement of Vedic literature named Srimad Bhagavatam, which is equal to all the Vedas, from my father. Srila Dwaipayana Vyasadeva. Purport. The statement made by Srila Shukadeva Goswami that the topmost transcendentalist who is beyond the jurisdiction of regulations and restrictions mainly takes to the task of hearing about and glorifying the personality of Godhead is verified by his personal example. Shukadeva Goswami being a recognized liberated soul and the topmost transcendentalist was accepted by all the topmost sages present in the meeting during the last seven days of Maharaj Prikshit. He cites from the example of his life that he himself was attracted by the transcendental activities of the Lord and he studied Srimad Bhagavatam from his great father, Sri Dwai Payana Vyasadeva. Srimad Bhagavatam, or for that matter, any other scientific literature, cannot be studied at home by one's own intellectual capacity. Medical books of anatomy or physiology are available in the market, but no one can become a qualified medical practitioner simply by reading such books at home. One has to be admitted into the medical college and study the books under the guidance of learned professors. Similarly, Srimad Bhagavatam, the postgraduate study of the science of Godhead, can be only can only be learned by studying it in, at the feet of self-realized souls like Srila Vyasadeva. Although Shukadeva Goswami was a liberated soul from the very day of his birth, he still had to take lessons of Srimad Bhagavatam from his great father Vyasadeva, who compiled the Srimad Bhagavatam under the instruction of another great soul, Sri Narada Muni. Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu instructed a learned Brahmana to study Srimad Bhagavatam from a personal Bhagavata. Srimad Bhagavatam is based on the transcendental name, form, attributes, pastimes, entourage, and variegatedness of the Supreme Person. And it is spoken by the incarnation of the personality of Godhead, Srila Vyasadeva. Pastimes of the Lord are executed in cooperation with his pure devotees. And consequently, historical incidents are mentioned in this great literature because they are related to Krishna. It is, <clears throat> it is called Brahma Samhitam because it is the sound representation of Lord Krishna, like the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is the sound incarnation of the Lord because it is spoken by the Supreme Lord, and Srimad Bhagavatam is the sound represent representative of the Lord because it was spoken by the incarnation of the Lord about the activities of the Lord. As stated in the beginning of this book, it is the essence of the Vedic desire tree and the natural commentation on the Brahma Sutras, the topmost philosophical theses on the subject matter of Brahman, Vyasadeva, of Brahman. Vyasadeva appeared at the end of Dwapara Yuga as the son of Satyavati, and therefore the word Dwapara Adao, Dwapara Adao, or the beginning of Dwapara Yuga, in this context means just prior to the beginning of Kali Yuga. 
The logic of this statement, according to Srila Jiva Goswami, is comparable to that of calling the upper portion of the tree the beginning. The root of the tree is the beginning of the tree, but in common knowledge, the upper portion of the tree is first seen. In that way, the end of the tree is accepted as its beginning. Parinishteti Parinishtito pi nargunya utama shloka lilaya grihita cheta rajarshe akyanam yad aditavan. O saintly king, I was certainly. O saintly king, I was certainly situated perfectly in transcendence, yet I was still attracted by the delineation of the pastimes of the Lord, who is described by enlightened verses. We're going to do a couple more and then we'll take a few reflections. The absolute truth is realized at the first instance as the impersonal Brahman by philosophical speculation and later as the super soul by further progress of transcendental knowledge. But if by the grace of the Lord and in an impersonalist is enlightened by the superior statements of Srimad Bhagavatam. He is also converted into a transcendental devotee of the personality of Godhead. With a poor fund of knowledge, we cannot adjust to the idea of the personality of the absolute truth, and therefore the personal activities of the Lord are deplored by the less intelligent impersonalists. But reasons and arguments together with the transcendental process of approaching the absolute truth help even the staunch impersonalist to become attracted by the personal activities of the Lord. A person like Shukadev Goswami cannot be attracted by any mundane activity, but when such a devotee is convinced by a superior method, he is certainly attracted by the transcendental activities of the Lord. The Lord is transcendental as are his activities. He is neither inactive nor impersonal. Tadaham te bhidya yanmi maha paurushiko bhavan yasya shraddha vatam ashu syan mukunde mati sati that very Srimad Bhagavatam I shall recite before you because you are the most sincere devotee of Lord Krishna. One who gives full attention and respect to hearing Srimad Bhagavatam achieves unflinching faith in the Supreme Lord, the giver of salvation. Purport, Srimad Bhagavatam is recognized Vedic wisdom and the system of receiving Vedic knowledge is called Avaroha Pantha or the process of receiving transcendental knowledge through bona fide disciplic succession. For advancement of material knowledge, there is a need for personal ability and researching aptitude. But in the case of spiritual knowledge, all progress depends more or less on the mercy of the spiritual master. The spiritual master must be satisfied with the disciple. Only then is knowledge automatically manifest before the student of spiritual science. The process should not, however, be misunderstood to be something like magical feats whereby the spiritual master acts like a magician and injects spiritual knowledge into his disciple as if surcharging him with an electrical current. The bona fide spiritual master reasonably explains everything to the disciple on the authorities of Vedic wisdom. The disciple can receive such teachings not exactly intellectually, but by submissive inquiries in a service attitude. The idea is that both the spiritual master and the disciple must be bona fide. In this case, the spiritual master, Shukadeva Goswami, is ready to recite exactly what he has learned from his great father, Srila Vyasadeva. And the disciple, Maharaj Prikshit, is a great devotee of Lord Krishna. A devotee of Lord Krishna is he who believes sincerely that by becoming a devotee of the Lord, one becomes fully equipped with everything spiritual. This teaching is imparted by the Lord himself in the pages of the Bhagavad Gita, in which it is clearly described that the Lord, Sri Krishna, is everything 
and that to surrender unto him solely and wholly makes one the most perfectly pious man. This unflinching faith in Lord Krishna prepares one to become a student of Srimad Bhagavatam. And one who hears Srimad Bhagavatam from a devotee like Shukadev Goswami is sure to attain salvation at the end, as Maharaj Prikshit did. The professional reader of Srimad Bhagavatam and the pseudo-devotees whose faith is based on one week's hearing are different from Shukadev Goswami and Maharaj Prikshit. Srila Vyasadeva explained Srimad Bhagavatam unto Shukadev Goswami from the very beginning of the Janmadyasya verse. And so Shukadev Goswami also explained it to the king. Lord Krishna is described in the Mahapurusha. Lord Krishna, excuse me, uh, 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 Lord Krishna is described as the Mahapurusha in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11. In his devotional feature as Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. One more time. Uh, Lord Krishna is described as the Mahapurusha in the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 11, in his devotional feature as Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Lord Krishna himself in his devotional attitude, descended to the earth to bestow special favors upon the fallen souls of this age of Kali. There are two verses particularly suitable to offer as prayers to this Mahapurusha feature of Lord Krishna. Deyam sada pari bhavagnam doham tirtas padam shiva varinchinutam sharanyam brityartiham pranatapala pabhadipotam vande mahapurusha te charanaravindam Tyaktva sadhusya jasurepshita raja lakshmim dharmishta arya vachasaya dagadaranyam maya mrigam daite yepshita man vadavad vande mahapurusha te charanaravindam. In other words, Purusha means the enjoyer and Mahapurusha means the supreme enjoyer or the supreme personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna. One who deserves to Approach the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna is called the Maharushika. Anyone who hears Srimad Bhagavatam attentively from its bona fide reciter is sure to become a sincere devotee of the Lord who is able to award liberation. There was none so attentive as Maharaj Prikshit in the matter of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, and there were was none so qualified as Shukadev Goswami to recite the text of Srimad Bhagavatam. Therefore, anyone who follows in the footsteps of either the ideal reciter or the ideal hearer, Shukadev Goswami and Maharaj Prikshit, respectively, will undoubtedly attain salvation like them. Haribo! Haribo! Maharaj Prikshit attains salvation by hearing only, and Shukadev Goswami attains salvation only by reciting. Recitation and hearing are two processes out of nine devotional activities and by strenuously following the principles, either in all or by parts, one can attain the absolute plane. So the complete text of Srimad Bhagavatam, beginning with the Janmadyasa verse, up to the last one in the 12th canto was spoken by Shukadeva Goswami, for the attainment of salvation by Maharaj Prikshit. In the Padma Purana, it is mentioned that Gautam, Rishi, Gautam Muni advised Maharaj Ambrish to hear regularly Srimad Bhagavatam as it was recited by Shukadeva Goswami. And herein it is confirmed that Maharaj Ambrish heard Srimad Bhagavatam from the very beginning to the end, as it was spoken by Shukadeva Goswami. One who is actually interested in the Bhagavatam, therefore, must not play with it by reading or hearing a portion from here and a portion from there. One must follow in the footsteps of great kings like Maharaj Ambarish and Maharaj Prikshit and hear it from a bona fide representative of Shukadev Goswami. Okay, are you all appreciating the poetic nature of Prabhupada's, poetical nature of Prabhupada's writings. It's quite amazing, isn't it? So let's take a few reflections, just 
either from the text or your realization or how you're feeling today. And we can put back the Zoom room so we can see our fellow devotees from around the world who have joined this yagya. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. So I really liked verse 5. Yeah, the glories of the hearing and chanting is uh, um, delineated in such an exalted way that um, uh, simply by hearing Bhagavatam, we can overcome the fear of death. Uh, because no matter how much we uh, talk about death, uh, when it comes close, there is always fear of losing everything. Um, but uh, when I hear that uh, constant reading and, and hearing Bhagavatam would help us overcome the fear in life, it gives so much happiness because um, we cannot live in fear, but all the time we are fearful of something. But uh, so I'm so happy to, to uh, hear that and so much confidence and I'm, I'm getting to hear more. Thank you so much. Such a nice point, Gandharvika Radha. That where else can one find a cure for the fear of death? It's not available in this world. People try in various ways to ignore it. Also, concerning your point in the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna makes this uh, a similar point when he mentions uh, that uh, those who have studied the science of Krishna consciousness know what's happening when death comes. As he says in 1511, yatanto yoginashchainam nainam pashyantya chetasa. The endeavoring transcendentalists who are situated in self-realization can see all this clearly, that is death. But those whose minds are not developed and who are not situated in self-realization cannot, cannot see what is taking place, although they may try to. Okay, let's have a few more points. Oh, who is next? I saw another hand up. Okay, Shraddha. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. I accept my most respectful obeisances. So, Guru Maharaj, I was just thinking about this, the statement that you made that just listening to stories about Krishna, we can attain perfection. And this is such a kindergartner's dream. And just the other day in my family, there was a discussion going on, what's better, a dancer or a doctor? And most of us said a dancer. And then, you know, the head of the family says, oh, yeah, dancers do nothing. Doctors at least help people. And immediately I thought of, but Kalia, uh, Kalia was delivered by Krishna dancing on his hood. And then I just started meditating on the whole story and then the prayers of Nagapatni. And then there were so many things that he said that I, was, I just couldn't agree to. But then I totally forgot about that. And my whole consciousness was absorbed in stories of Krishna one after the other. So I, I, I was just, the moment you said it, that that incident just came up and I was my whole countenance changed basically I was just so happily situated thinking about the stories of Krishna one after the other. Where did you come up with the dancer or doctor thing? Is that a thing I don't know. or did you just pick it up? <laughs> no so what happened in the family uh, chat group so my uncle is the head of the family so he just said and we are like mostly uh, women outnumber men in my family <laughs> so uh, so out of six women, who, he just threw a question that what profession would you choose, a doctor or a dancer? It was an odd choice to begin with, but yeah, whatever. And then just two of them replied doctor and most of us said dancer. And then uh, we gave our own reasons, but he said, no, you know, whatever logics, logics have got nothing to do with the facts. You know, dancers do nothing, but the doctors help people. And then suddenly I thought, but Kalia was delivered by Krishna, dancing on the hood. I mean, he didn't any, do any surgery and so on and so forth. So That's nice. What a great family discussion. And I like the title very much, Dancer or Doctor. Beautiful. Thank you, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Yes, yeah, Sukeshri. Hare Krishna Prabhu. 
I was uh, just going to do a follow up, and I was also going to comment. Uh, follow up to what Dhanavi Kamadaji is saying. Um, we've been reading Bhagavatam all uh, yesterday with Jashi Rade, and uh, I could see the change in her. By the time she was in the afternoon, she started reading Bhagavatam herself. She was only listening. Several devotees were reading for her. I felt that the the whole day of reading Bhagavatam it was amazing. I mean the transformation from a uh, real difficulty to and then so we're going back today again we'll be reading and we want to read all through as many days as possible you know so she felt so um you know contented in in spite of all the things you know so i just i just felt the uh, real practical example of how bhagavatam is actually really saving um so many so many of us bhagavatam is the answer it's the panacea thank you very much okay last yeah, one and the yeah, the comment I was just going to say, Prabhu, is Medi, Griha Medi that we read. I never knew Griha Medi means, Medi meant um, enviousness. So that was a huge uh, revelation for me today. I mm. heard, I have heard that word, but I never realized that Griha Medi are people who are envious. Thank you. Yeah, it is quite startling and helpful to know actually the ingredient in the material world that ruins everything. Same activities, but because the attitude is enviousness, everything becomes spoiled. Yes. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, uh, as you were relishing the purport by Prabhupada, uh, I, you know, I, I, I just started thinking how, uh, you know, the deep, uh, sincere appreciation or faith uh, you have for the speak, uh, the writer, uh, of course, you know, uh, the commentary. And, you know, it's just like following the same step, you know, hearing from the authorized source, but the faith in that source is so deep, you know, when you're relishing that part, it just makes me feel, you know, if we have that, then, you know, Krishna within us will you know, switch, the, switch that faith. So uh, I was just relishing when you were relishing that part. So I was so happy. So just wanted to share. So this is a nice point. In the Shastra, it said, Yasya Devi para bhaktira yata Devi tatagaro tasyaite katita yarda prakashanti mahatmana. Then, when the faith is there in Krishna and Guru, then there's a natural way in which one understands the import of the Vedic knowledge. And it's a point made also at the very beginning of the Bhagavatam when the sages are appreciating. Sutta Goswami, and they say, Vetatam saumya tat sarvam tatvatas taranugrahat bruyu snigdasya shishyasya guravo kuhyamap yuta. That you're, you've, you're such a gentle soul, and the way you've approached all your gurus with submissiveness is why they've filled you up with the Vedic knowledge. And Prabhupada made that very point in these purports that one has to have this uh, sense of uh, faith. And it's not exactly book knowledge. Like he said, a doctor isn't made by somebody going home and curling up with a textbook. You actually have to enter into the school. <laughs> and uh, similarly, we have to be ensconced in uh, this association with pure devotees and, and serving and appreciating and it, it comes in a different way than academic knowledge comes. Thank you for bringing that out. Okay, uh, okay. last two points. Uh, we have online, who is that? I can't see because of the light. Is that Madhava Govinda? His effulgence yes, is too bright. Please remove the effulgence of your transcendental rays so we can see your form of bliss. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Maharaj, for the stating. I was remembering the Govardhan reading from uh, two years ago. It's like the old days, right? Yeah. yeah. And I uh, was just finishing the point which in the Bhagavatam, in the 10th uh, verse, the last verse, which you read, in Prabhupada says, makes a very nice distinction about uh, how one can acquire material knowledge and how the spiritual knowledge is acquired. Where he was saying that how spiritual knowledge depends upon the, more or less it depends on the mercy of the spiritual master. At the same time, Prabhupada clarifies to say that it's not just some magical key, but it's actually in a very authorized state, the speaking master teaches the knowledge. And in the disciple on, the, on his part, 
he is serving him in submission and with service at uh, the submission. Yeah, such a, uh, a clearly made point. Prabhupada makes this again and again because people oftentimes think that it's just some kind of a a cheap process that somebody touches you on the head and then you're zapped and that's it. But it requires, as is being pointed out here, reciprocation from the two sides. As is being pointed out, the best speaker is Shukadev, the best hearer is Prikshit Maharaj. When you have those two together, then there's a combustion, spiritual combustion. Last point. So, uh, uh, some, one of the purports, Srila Prabhupada says that uh, Srimad Bhagavatam uh, cannot be studied alone uh, at home, you know, by, I don't know, remember the words, but by using our own mental, you know, capacity. It should be, we should study it under a person Bhagavata. So, that is something, you know, we should always uh, make note of. Yes, that's right. It's a very personal process. Okay. Right. So we're continuing now with the second canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. We're right there, front row seats with Shukade Goswami and Maharaj Prikshit. Couldn't get more intimate. And here comes the best verse ever. Etan nirvidyamananam ichitam akatobhayam Yoginam nripa niranitam harer namanu kirtanam. O King, constant chanting of the holy name of the Lord after the ways of the great authorities is the doubtless and fearless way of success for all, including those who are free from all material desires, those who are desirous of all material enjoyment, and also those who are self satisfied by dint of transcendental knowledge, purport. In the previous verse, the great necessity for attaining attachment to Mukunda has been accredited. There are different types of persons who desire to attain success in different varieties of pursuits. Generally, the persons are materialists who desire to enjoy the fullest extent of material gratification. Next to them are the transcendentalists who have attained perfect knowledge about the nature of material enjoyment and thus are aloof from such an illusory way of life. More or less, they are satisfied in themselves by self-realization. Above them are the devotees of the Lord who neither aspire to enjoy the material world nor desire to get out of it. They are after the satisfaction of the Lord Sri Krishna. In other words, the devotees of the Lord do not want anything on their personal account. If the Lord desires, the devotees can arrange all sorts of material facilities. And if the Lord does not desire this, the devotees can leave aside all sorts of facilities, even up to the limit of salvation. Nor are they self-satisfied because they want the satisfaction of the Lord only. In this verse, Srila Shukadeva Goswami recommends the transcendental chanting of the holy name of the Lord. By a fenceless chanting and hearing of the holy name of the Lord, one becomes acquainted with the transcendental form of the Lord and then with the attributes of the Lord and then with the transcendental nature of his pastimes, etc. Here it is mentioned that one should constantly chant the holy name of the Lord after hearing it from authorities. This means that hearing from authorities is the first essential. Hearing of the holy name gradually promotes one to the stage of hearing about his form, his attributes, his pastimes, and so on. And thus the necessity of the chanting of his glories develops successively. This process is recommended not only for the successful execution of devotional service, but also even for those who are materially attached. According to Sri Shukadev Goswami, this way of attaining success is an established fact, concluded not only by him, but also by all other previous acharyas. Therefore, there is no need of further evidence. The process is recommended not only for the progressive students in different departments of ideological success, 
but also for those who are already successful in their achievement as fruitive workers, as philosophers, or as devotees of the Lord. Srila Jiva Goswami instructs that chanting of the holy name of the Lord should be loudly done, and it should be performed offenselessly as well, as recommended in the Padma Purana. One can deliver himself from the effects of all sins by surrendering himself unto the Lord. One can deliver himself from all offenses at the feet of the Lord by taking shelter of his holy name. But one cannot protect himself if one commits an offense at the feet of the holy name of the Lord. Such offenses are mentioned in the Padma Purana as being ten in number. The first offense is to vilify the great devotees who have preached about the glories of the Lord. The second offense is to see the holy names of the Lord in terms of worldly distinction. The Lord is the proprietor of all the universes, and therefore he may be known in different places by different names. But that does not in any way qualify the fullness of the Lord. No, excuse me. Uh, he, uh, excuse. The Lord is the proprietor of all the universes, and therefore he may be known in different places by different names, but that does not in any way qualify the fullness of the Lord. Any nomenclature which is meant for the Supreme Lord is as holy as the others because they are all meant for the Lord. Such holy names are as powerful as the Lord, and there is no bar for anyone in any part of the creation to chant and glorify the Lord by the particular name of the Lord as it is locally understood. They are all auspicious, and one should not distinguish such names of the Lord as material commodities. The third offense is to neglect the orders of the authorized acharyas or spiritual masters. The fourth is to vilify scriptures or Vedic knowledge. The fifth offense is to, is to define the holy name of the Lord in terms of one's mundane calculation. The holy name of the Lord is identical with the Lord himself, and one should understand the holy name of the Lord to be non-different from him. The sixth offense is to interpret the holy name. The Lord is not imaginary, nor is his holy name. There are persons with a poor fund of knowledge who think the Lord to be an imagination of the worshiper, and therefore think his holy name to be imaginary. Such a chanter of the name of the Lord cannot achieve the desired success in the matter of chanting the holy name. The seventh offense is to commit sins intentionally on the strength of the holy name. In the scriptures it is said that one can be liberated from the effects of all sinful actions simply by chanting the holy name of the Lord. But one who takes advantage of this transcendental method and continues to commit sins on the strength commit sins on the expectation of neutralizing the effects of sins by chanting the holy name of the lord is the greatest offender at the feet of the holy name such an offender cannot purify himself by any recommended method of purification in other words one may be a sinful man before chanting the holy name of the lord but after taking shelter in the holy name of the Lord and becoming immune, one should strictly restrain oneself from committing sinful acts with the hope that his method of chanting the holy name will give him protection. The eighth offense is to consider the holy name of the Lord and his chanting method to be equal to some material auspicious activity. There are various kinds of good works for material benefits, but the holy name and his chanting are not mere auspicious holy services. Undoubtedly, the holy name is holy service, but he should never be utilized for such purposes. Such, since the holy name and the Lord are of one and the same identity, one should not try to bring the holy name into the service of mankind. Lost. Uh, 
One should strictly restrain oneself from committing sinful acts with the hope that his method of chanting the holy name will give him protection. The eighth offense is to consider the holy name of the Lord and his chanting method to be equal to some material auspicious activities. There are various kinds of good works for material benefits, but the holy name and his chanting are not mere auspicious holy services. Undoubtedly, the holy name is holy service, but he should never be utilized for such purposes. Since the Holy Name and the Lord are of one and the same identity, one should not try to bring the Holy Name into the service of mankind. The idea is that the Supreme Lord is the Supreme Enjoyer. He is no one's servant or order supplier. Similarly, the Holy Name of the Lord is identical with the Lord. One should not try to utilize the holy name for one's personal services. And I missed the word since. Similarly, since the holy name of the Lord is identical with the Lord, one should not try to utilize the holy name for one's personal service. The ninth offense is to instruct those who are not interested in chanting the holy name of the Lord about the transcendental nature of the holy name. If such instruction is imparted to an unwilling audience, the act is considered to be an offense at the feet of the Holy Name. The tenth offense is to become uninterested in the Holy Name of the Lord, even after hearing of the transcendental nature of the Holy Name. The effect of chanting the Holy Name of the Lord is perceived by the chanter as liberation from the conception of false Egoism. False egoism is exhibited by thinking oneself to be the enjoyer of the world and thinking everything in the world to be meant for the enjoyment of one's self only. The whole materialistic world is moving under such false egoism as of I and mine, but the factual effect of chanting the holy name is to become free from such misconceptions. Text number 12. Kim Pramatasya Bahubhi Parukshair Hayanair Iha Varam Muhur Tam Viditam Gaha Gata Te Shreyase Yata. What is the value of a prolonged life which is wasted, inexperienced by years in this world? Better a moment of full consciousness because that gives one a start in searching after his supreme interest. Purport. Srila Shukadeva Goswami instructed Maharaj Prikshit about the importance of the chanting of the holy name of the Lord by every progressive gentleman. In order to encourage the king who had only seven remaining days of life, Srila Shukadeva Goswami asserted that there is no use in living hundreds of years without any knowledge of the problems of life. Better to live a life, better to live for a moment with full consciousness of the supreme interest to be fulfilled. The supreme interest of life is eternal with full knowledge and bliss. Those who are bewildered by the external features of the material world and are engaged in the animal propensities of the eat, drink, and be merry type of life are simply wasting their lives by the unseen passing away of valuable years. We should know in perfect consciousness that human life is bestowed upon the conditioned soul to achieve spiritual success. And the easiest possible procedure to attain this end is to chant the holy name of the Lord. In the previous verse, we have discussed this point to a certain extent, and we may further be enlightened on the different types of offenses committed unto the feet of the holy name. Srila Jiva Goswami Prabhu has quoted many passages from authentic scriptures and has ably supported the statements in the matter of offenses at the feet of the holy name from Vishnu Yamala Purana. No, from Vishnu Yamala Tantra. From where? Srila Jiva Goswami has proven that one can be liberated from the effects of all sins simply by chanting the holy name of the Lord. Quoting from the uh, Markandeya Purana, from which Purana? Markandeya Purana. 
Sri Goswamiji says that one should neither blaspheme the devotee of the Lord nor indulge in hearing others who are engaged in belittling a devotee of the Lord. A devotee should try to restrict the vilifier by cutting out his tongue or being unable to do so, one should commit suicide rather than hear the blaspheming of the devotee of the Lord. The conclusion is that one should neither hear nor allow vilification of a devotee of the Lord. As far as distinguishing the Lord's holy name from the names of the demigods, the revealed scriptures disclose that all extraordinary powerful beings are but parts and parcels of the supreme energetic Lord Krishna. Except for the Lord himself, everyone is subordinate. No one is independent of the Lord. Since no one is more powerful than or equal to the energy of the Supreme Lord, no one's name can be as powerful as that of the Lord. By chanting the Lord's holy name, one can derive all the stipulated energy synchronized from all sources. <laughs> Haribo! <laughs> Therefore, one should not equalize the supreme holy name of the Lord with any other name. Brahma, Shiva, or any other powerful god can never be equal to the supreme Lord Vishnu. The powerful holy name of the Lord can certainly deliver one from sinful effects, but one who desires to utilize this transcendental potency of the holy name of the Lord in one's sinister activities is the most degraded person in the world. Such persons are never excused by the Lord or by any agent of the Lord. One should therefore utilize one's life in glorifying the Lord by all means, without any offense. Such activity of life, even for a moment, is never to be compared to a prolonged life of ignorance, like the lives of the trees and other living entities who may live for thousands of years without prosecuting spiritual advancement. Here we go, Katvanga, one of our heroes. Katvango nama rajarshir, gyatve yatam iha yusha, mahurtat sarvam utsrija, gatavan abayam harim. The saintly king, Katvanga, after being informed that the duration of his life would be only a moment more, at once freed himself from all material activities and took shelter of the supreme safety, the personality of Godhead. Purport, the fully responsible man should always be conscious of the prime duty of the present human form of life. The activities to meet the immediate necessities of material life are not everything. One should always be alert in his duty for attainment of the best situation in the next life. Human life is meant for preparing ourselves for that prime duty. Maharaj Katvanga is mentioned herein as a saintly king because even within the responsibility of the state management, management he was not at all forgetful of the prime duty of life. Such was the case with other Rajarshi saintly kings like Maharaj Yudhishthir and Maharaj Prikshit. They were all exemplary personalities on account of their being alert in discharging their prime duty. Maharaj Katvanga was invited by the demigods in the higher planets to fight demons. And as a king, he fought the battles to the full satisfaction of the demigods. The demigods, being fully satisfied with him, wanted to give him some benediction for material enjoyment. But Maharaj Katvanga, being very much alert to his prime duty, inquired from the demigods about his remaining duration of life. This means that he was not as anxious to accumulate some material benediction from the demigods as he was to prepare himself for the next life. He was informed by the demigods, however, that his life would last only a moment longer. The king at once left the heavenly kingdom, which is always full of material enjoyment of the highest standard, and, and uh, coming to this earth, took ultimate shelter of the all-safe 
personality of Godhead. He was successful in his great attempt and achieved liberation. This attempt, even for a moment, by the saintly king was successful because he was always alert to his prime duty. Maharaj Prichit was thus encouraged by the great Shukadeva Goswami, even though he had only seven days left in his life to execute the prime duty of hearing the glories of the Lord in the form of Srimad Bhagavatam. By the will of the Lord, Maharaj Prichit instantaneously met the great Shukadev Goswami and the great treasure of spiritual success left by him is nicely mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Marj Katvanga Ki Jai Tavap Ye Tarhi Kauravya Saptaham Jivita Vadi Upakalpaya Tatsarvam Tavat Yat Samparayi you come. Marj Prichit, now your duration of life is limited to seven more days. So during this time, you can perform all those rituals which are needed for the best purpose of your next life. Purport. Shukadev Goswami, after citing the example of Marj Katvanga, who prepared himself for the next life within a very short time, encouraged Maharaj Prichit by saying that since he still had seven days at his disposal, he could easily take advantage of the time to prepare himself for the next life. Indirectly, the Goswami told Maharaj Prichit that he should take shelter of the sound representation of the Lord for the next seven days, still remaining in the duration of his life, and thus get himself liberated. In other words, Everyone can best prepare himself for the next life simply by hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, as it was recited by Shukadeva Goswami to Maharaj Prichit. The rituals are not formal, but there are also some favorable conditions which are required to be carried out as instructed hereafter. Aren't you happy to be so perfectly situated yes. in your life? It makes you happy, right? Yeah. Because this is the you know, organizing the uh, around this principle of hearing Srimad Bhagavatam constantly, and always being alert to one's ultimate duty in life, despite the fact that one has to make so many other arrangements just to survive, is uh, confirmed here as the perfect life. Antakali to Purusha, Agate Gata. Sad vasaha chindyad asanga shastrena spriham dehe nuye chatam. At the last stage of one's life, one should be bold enough to not be afraid of death, but one must cut off all attachment to the material body and everything pertaining to it and all desires thereof. Purport. The foolishness of gross materialism is that people think of making a permanent settlement in this world. Although it is a settled fact that one has to give up everything here and has, that has been uh, created by valuable human energy. Great statesmen, scientists, philosophers, etc. who are foolish without any information of the spirit soul think that this life of a few years only is all in all and that there is nothing more after death. This poor fund of knowledge, even in the so-called learned circles of the world, is killing the vitality of human energy and the awful result is being keenly felt. And yet the foolish materialistic men do not care about what is going to happen in the next life. The preliminary instruction in the Bhagavad Gita is that one should know that the identity of the individual living entity is not lost even after the end of this present body, which is nothing but an outward dress only. As one changes an old garment, so the individual living being also changes his body, and this change of body is called death. Death is therefore a process of changing the body at the end of the duration of the present life. An intelligent person must be prepared for this 
end must try to have the best type of body in the next life. The best type of body is a spiritual body which is obtained by those who go back to the kingdom of God or enter the realm of Brahman. In the second chapter of this canto, this matter will be broadly discussed, but as far as the change of body is concerned, one must prepare now for the next life. Foolish people attach more importance to the present temporary life, and thus the foolish leaders make appeals to the body and to bodily relations. The bodily relations extend not only to this body, but also to the family members, wife, children, society, country, and so many other things which end at the end of life. After death, one forgets everything about the present bodily relations. We have a little experience of this at night when we go to sleep. While sleeping, we forget everything about this body and bodily relations. Although this, although this forgetfulness is a temporary situation for only a few hours, death is nothing but sleeping for a few months in order to develop another term of bodily engagement which we are awarded by the law of nature according to our aspiration. Therefore, one has only to change the aspiration during the course of this present body. Somebody look it up. It's such a nice word. And for this, there is a need of training in the current duration of human life. This training can be begun at any stage of life or even a few seconds before death. But the usual procedure is for one to get the training from the early, from very early life, from the stage of brahmacharya and gradually progress to the grahastha, vanaprastha, and sannyas orders of life. The institution which gives such training is called varnashrama dharma or the system of sanatan dharma, the best procedure for making the human life perfect. One is therefore required to give up the attachment to family or social or political life just at the age of 50 years, if not earlier. And the training in the Vanaprastha and Sannyas ashram is given for preparation of the next life. Foolish materialists in the garb of leaders of the people in general stick to family affairs without attempting to cut off relations with them and thus they become victims of nature's law and get gross bodies again, according to their work. Such foolish leaders may have some respect from the people at the end of life, but that does not mean that such leaders will be immune to the natural laws under which everyone is tightly bound by the hands and feet. The best thing is, therefore, that everyone voluntarily give up family relations by transferring the attachment from family, society, country, and everything thereof to the devotional service of the Lord. It is stated herein that one should give up all desires of family attachment. One must have a chance for better desires. Otherwise, there is no chance of giving up such morbid desires. Desire is the concomitant factor of the living entity. The living entity is eternal, and therefore his desires, which are natural for a living being, are also eternal. One cannot therefore stop desiring, but the subject matter for desires can be changed. So one must develop the desire for returning home back to Godhead, and automatically the desires for material gain, material honor, and material popularity will diminish in proportion to the development of devotional service. A living being is meant for service activities and his desires are centered around such a service attitude. Beginning from the top executive head of the state down to the insignificant pauper in the street, all are rendering some sort of service to others. The perfection of such a service attitude is only attained simply by transferring the desire of service from matter to spirit or from Satan to God. Uh, let's see the Zoom room. Hare Krishna, dear devotees, thank you for joining. Uh, what is the word aspiration? Let's hear the etymology. 
uh, aspiration is noun and the process of being mentally situated to do or feel something especially to something creative uh, a sudden brilliant creative or timely idea uh, the drawing in of in of breath the drawing of inner breath yeah inhalation inhalation yeah and origin aspiration is, yeah origin is late uh, latin Ins from latin inspirare 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 bringing in breath so where does it come does anybody look in etymoline etymological online dictionary etymol online we want a little more if we can you got it gandharvi hey krishna prabhu oh, oh there you are please who is that this is priya kishori prabhu oh i thought it was priya kishori okay go ahead <laughs> aspiration from the uh, 1530s acting of breathing into from latin aspirationem nominative of aspiratio a breathing in on a blowing upon rough breathing influence um a noun of action uh from the past participle stem of aspirare which means to strive for seek to reach and it literally means to breathe at or blow upon what? and uh, what was that last sentence it yeah. said uh breathe at or blow upon and the meaning they say is steadfast longing for a higher goal earnest steadfast desire steadfast longing for a higher goal and earnest desire for something above one that could be a lyric in a song steadfast longing for a, for a what goal for a higher goal steadfast longing for a higher goal okay keep going Just and then that. it says um a earnest desire for something above one is recorded from the 1600s sometimes collectively as aspirations and then aspiration in late 14th century is action of in action of aspirating a spirit letter or sound yeah. it's like you know it's like your life breath what you really want another one is um the notion is of panting with desire panting with desire to it's almost in a sense aspiration cuz it's like breathing it's it's what keeps you alive it's what's you know your purpose for living it's as it's as important to you as your breath the thing you're after your aspiration it's amazing that living beings can have aspirations cuz that's the nature of consciousness to aspire for something why are you breathing why well, want this thing otherwise you just stop breathing it's like eh forget it it's not worth it some people become disappointed with the whole idea of life itself and they want to become void want to stop breathing no more life I'll like take a couple of reflections yes Prabhu oh sorry yeah go ahead um He's could could I ask a question Yes because who he who rules he or she who rules the airwaves wins. <laughs> I heard that during uh, a political campaign. Go ahead. Um so you were mentioning that um the last offense which is even after understanding the glories of the holy name one is um one feels disinterested in the holy name i find that to be very um interesting because how is it that if the glories of the holy names and the supreme lord are all in capturing to the mind and heart how is it um and what is so um miserable to the living entity that one would forget and and lose interest in chanting the holy name um and how do we avoid losing interest which it seems like a path that we go down it's very hard to come back from it's a disease and once you catch the dread disease then you have to cure yourself of the disease set krishna nama charitari sitapta vidya pitopa tapta rasena sena rochikanu kintwa varad anudilam kalu saiv jushta swadvikramad bhavati tad garamula hantri this disease takes over at the root of our existence and makes us taste what is sweet to be bitter and so you have to take the medicine at first just like when you got jaundice 
sugarcane juice, which is the curative, tastes bitter, which is ridiculous because it's the best beverage on earth. You put a little ginger and lime in it on a nice hot day in Bangalore and you know, a nice clay cup. So then you think it's terrible, but it's not because you're diseased. Not you. You're not diseased at all. But I'm just saying one becomes diseased and tastes it and then uh, tastes something that's sweet to be bitter. So then Rupa Goswami says, take it as medicine. Now you take it as medicine in your diseased state. Even though you, you don't like the taste, you have to fortify your intelligence. Evam buddhi param budva samstab yatmana matmana jahishatram mahabaho kamarupam durasadam. Krishna tells Arjuna at the end of the third chapter, said, because the enemy has captured the various places in your body, the senses, the mind, and sometimes even the intelligence. You have to defeat that enemy by getting superior knowledge, hearing Bhagavad Gita. And then once your intelligence becomes strong, you have this stronghold within the hierarchy of your senses through which you can then dominate the mind. So, no, I don't like this. It's like, and then the intelligence adult in the room said, no, you still have to take your medicine. Have you ever had that? He's like, I don't want to take it. And so your, some parent or guardian says, no, you have to take it. I don't want to go to school. No, you have to go to school. I don't want to clean my room. No, you have to clean your room. So you have to have that influence in your life coming from Shastra. Because Shastra means like it's telling you you can do this the easy way or the hard way. Easy way. You listen to me, and you do it. The hard way, shastra. The weapon comes out, we get cut by material nature. So at first, we have faith. We develop faith in shastra. And we follow the shastra, even though we don't want to. We don't have a taste. And then, gradually, we uh, are cured of the disease of lust. And because we, we get uh, cured, we start to taste the sweetness of the holy name. And then... Param Jishra Nivartite. Then Vishaya Vinivartante Nirahara Sadehina Rasavarjam Rasopyasat Param Jishra Nivartite. At first I'm restraining myself, I'm using my intellect, but then later I taste something that's so nice I go like forget this other thing. Best example I ever saw of this. I was in New York City. We were doing Sankirtan, my friend and I, Prem Kishore, and we had a huge table out there with all kinds of books on it and uh, just freely distributing books there on a hot summer day in front of the New York Public Library. And uh, Prem Kishore had a penchant for giving out Mahaprasadam, not just any Mahaprasadam, it had to come right off the altar. And so Radha Govinda, every day, were taking these huge pieces of uh, milk perfi, milk sweets, in large squares. And he kept a little Tupperware with them inside. And so there was this family from Europe, and they were obviously on vacation in New York. They had vacation clothes on. And the two kids who looked a, a little bit um, bedraggled because they're being dragged around the whole city, but they were happy to be eating these ice cream cones, double decker. And so the guy had just purchased a book and was, seemed to be happy about it. And so Prem Kishore then, after selling the book with his own hands, he handed the kids each a, a burfi. And as he was handing them, they were standing right next to a trash can. They dumped the ice cream cones and took the burfi. <laughs> and I thought, Param Drishva Nivartate. They could sense the jiva was in there. This is something special. This ice cream cone, my dad get us another one later. So... You know, when we get something nice as a jiva, it's just our nature. We go like, God, I like this better. Forget this other thing. Where'd you go? It's like, nah, I'm busy. So we have, to, we have to get that taste. But in the beginning, it requires some alignment through our intelligence. It has to be a, an adult in the room to help us. Okay, let's take just a couple more. Prabhu. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Priya Kishori, for appearing here today through sound. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, I was appreciating um, the definitions of death that Prabhupada had given in, the, in one of the purports. He, he says that death is nothing but sleeping for a few months in order to develop another term of bodily engagement 
which we are awarded by the law of nature according to our aspiration. Yes. It's quite startling, isn't it? Because in the course of my day, I may just take everything for granted, the sleeping stage, the waking up stage. But when it's pointed out to us that here's what you're going through on a daily basis, and that that's comparable to my entire life cycle going from one life to the next, it's quite a revelation, isn't it? In fact, it's analogous with showing people the picture of the changing bodies. The changing bodies is... Um, is she leaving? I have... You, thank you. It's a, it's a revelation to the man on the street. We look at it every day and think like, yeah, it's changing bodies, but other people see it and they are quite startled by it. When I was going to Salesforce every week, sometimes I take, I have one of the original changing bodies exhibits. It was made by the same devotee who made our Prabhupada Didi. And I carry it into the lobby to get my permit there and just walking in with it. People are busy, they're walking back and forth, but they stop and go, <laughs> you get a little circle of people around looking at it. And they got in the elevator and everyone in the whole, you know, usually everyone's blabbing in there, but they all turned around and they, I was surrounded, you know, they were looking and the well, guys, he says, what does that mean? I said, what do you think it means? <laughs> They're like, wow. So when we hear these points about how the condition of our life, a death, is just prepare, preparation for the next life and so forth, and we can see it on a graph, we can hear about it. It's quite a revelation. Okay, one more. Yes. Uh, Harish Maharaj, I just want to share a reflection. that So every day I talk to my mom for a half an hour. So... Um, we, we used to talk on different topics and finally we got into some arguments and then um, I thought like what is the best way that, can, that we can engage our conversation and from past maybe one few days or few weeks we started reading Srimad Bhagavatam with my uh, mother and um, she um, like we are reading in our mother tongue Telugu and um, so she reads almost uh, we thought of reading translations every uh, every chapter one um, one chapter one day so i thought like it, it's a like the best way that we we are able to uh, communicate and uh, engage the time um, yeah th i just thought of sharing that that's a really nice point and just hearing straight through is always really helpful questions come up and they get answered in the next purport and also it carries us to a higher level of consciousness. Okay, well, let's take... Oh, is that Malini? Malini. Okay, please. Hare please. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Prabhu, um, thank you so much, Prabhu, for this reading. Um, there's one verse, um, this is verse number 10, uh, that stuck me a lot. Um, it says that Manu gives full attention and respect to hearing Srimad Bhagavatam uh, they achieve the unflinching faith in the Supreme Lord. Um, I was thinking the only thing that is separating us uh, from being in Golok Vrindavan is this unflinching faith. And uh, Shukadev Goswami has given us the solution why we don't have that faith is that, uh, I mean, this is for me that I do not have full attention, I don't give full attention and respect to hearing Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, this is a perfect way to start Kartik by, by meditating on this part, Prabhu. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, by hearing and chanting in the association of devotees, that faith grows. And we know, yadrishi yadrishi shraddha siddhir bhavati tadrishi. By the gradual increase of faith, then we're coming closer and closer to perfection. The more we develop that faith, the more perfect we are. Mm -hmm. And the more impervious we are to the onslaught of material temptations, because we already have... Shraddha, we've put our heart somewhere else. It's out of reach of the material world. No mas. I'm already done. Yes. Prabhu, can I ask a question, Prabhu? Sure. Um, Prabhu, in the, in the verse where we're reading 
talking about the ten offenses to the holy name um, in the previous in one of those uh, purports. Uh, Prabhupada mentioned that we should not use the um, holy name for material purposes, um, and um, uh, and and sometimes Prabhu that uh, many devotees, sorry, or many other people who are not devotees ask us to pray, and and we do chant. And we do pray for them to the holy name to give them relief or or whatever they're suffering from. So is that considered as a as a material thing, um, or how do we take that, Prabhu? Yeah, that's a material thing. We shouldn't do that. Mm. We don't employ the holy name for medicinal purposes. Please cure somebody's gout or something like that. But mm. we can pray that the person can get shelter at the holy name at the mm-hmm. lotus feet of the holy name. You see in the verse, in the first chapter of the Bhagavatam, apana samsritim goranya nama vivashogranan tatasadyo vimucheta ya bipeti swayam bayam. Uh, Prabhupada mentions, of course this verse means that Krishna is not different from his name and he's feared by fear personified. Therefore, if you want protection in the material world from fear and all fearsome people in fierce, fearful situations, you should say, Hare Krishna! Hare Krishna! Or as Damodar Vamsi Dari says, Oh Jagannath! <laughs> so, uh, we should um, take shelter of the Holy Name, and when we're praying for others, you know, pray that they, they can get shelter, Krishna's lotus feet, and protection from, from Krishna. Something like that. But we careful about the language that, you know, please cure this and that. You know, it's not mm-hmm. not to in, engage the holy name in service like that, mm-hmm. but rather ask that mm-hmm. the person can get the shelter of the holy name and be become a great devotee, something like that. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you so much. Jai. Thanks for the question. It's very practical. Okay. Uh, Maharaj, yes. I have a follow-up question to that. Uh, so in Bhagavad Gita, we we read uh, we read that rain uh, yagyas by performance of yagyas rains come. So if someone chants the holy name so that rains come, is that an offense? That will it be considered as an eighth offense? Because that's like a material thing. Well, in the in the Bhagavad Gita, we're asked to do prescribe yagyas out of gratitude, because we're receiving uh, many. Um, benefits from the devas and therefore one sh- one shouldn't just ign- take them for granted but you should perform yagya but ultimately devarshi bhutatna nrinam pitranam na kinkaro nayam nrinicha rajan saravatmara ya sharanam sharanyam katomu kundam parihrita kartam bhagavatam's version is that if you're surrendering to mukunda who is the source of all the devas then you have no more debt to all these other personalities. And this is also the conclusion in Bhagavad Gita. Sarvadaraman putya mame kam sharanam braja hung tong sarva papi biomokshai shami masuchaha. Just surrender unto me. Don't worry about all the other little details here and there. And that goes for leaving one's body in the end of the 8th chapter of, of the Gita, Naiti Sriti Partajanan, Yogi Muyati Kashchana. Krishna is saying that the, the, the devotees, well, they, they know these paths. There are all these different detailed paths for leaving the world. It's like, it's up to you, Krishna. My point is that we, we're not doing uh, yajna for getting rain for sense gratification. Uh, first of all, it's, it's really, uh, the Bhagavatam version is that we should do yajna to please Krishna because that's our duty as his parts and parcels. And above duty, when one does that dutifully for some time, then one begins to develop love for Krishna. Vasudeva sarvamiti sa mahatma sudilabaha. One realizes that Vasudeva is everything. He's all the devas too. <laughs> Who is behind it? He's not self-interested. That let me be satisfied here in the material world by doing yajna, but let me satisfy Krishna because we love him. Ultimately, you know, Krishna makes uh, this point in the Govardhan Puja because all the coward men are getting ready to do this Indra Puja 
And he walks up to him and says, so why are you doing this anyway? And is it just a tradition or is there some philosophy behind it? And then, <laughs> you know, and also he pointed out in the previous pastime with the wives of the brahmanas, the wives of the brahmanas, uh, the, the husbands had uh, done all the rituals properly, but they had neglected Krishna and Balaram, so they were useless. Same with with uh, Roma Harshan. Roma Harshan was perfectly aligned with all Vedic knowledge. She knew everything except how to respect the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, Balaram said, you can uh, leave your body now because <laughs> you're not a proper representative. So at all points, the Gita, the, the conclusion points towards the purpose of Yajna is to simply to please Krishna. Savaipum samparo dharmo yato bhaktir rhoksaje ahaitu ki apritiyata yayatma suprasiditi uninterrupted and unmotivated. We're not doing it for some selfish purpose. So I think uh, the reading today goes till like 9.15 or something. Uh, Hare Krishna. 9.30? Actually in the message it, it was set till 9 o'clock but I see there are more Devotees on the Zoom who haven't turned their videos on, but they raised their hands. I see. Okay, let's take a couple more and then I'll go because I have to meet with, uh, I have a meeting at 10. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. This is Mona. Hi, Hare, Krishna. Uh, Hare Krishna. Uh, my question is that if, can we offer prasadam to people who we know that they are they're eating all the wrong things that we don't agree with, basically. But if can I offer prasadam to them? Well, if we were to restrict giving prasadam to only people who are eating things that we knew about and that we approved of, we wouldn't distribute much prasadam at all. So the answer is yes, you may. There is uh, no restriction on distributing prasadam. We give it here, there, and everywhere. It's purifying for everyone. I meant to say when um, I'm doing puja at home and yes. I offer Krishna something. And then when I go to work, some people I know they're vegetarian. They don't even eat eggs. I offer, but somebody, if they raise their hand, can I have it? Uh, but I know they're not the followers. And Yeah, you can give it to them. In fact, it's helpful to give it to them because when they take prasadam, then they'll get a higher taste. And it's one of the ways they come in contact with Krishna. I mean, lots of people come to the temple uh, that, um, I mean, nowadays, more and more people, they're already oriented to Vedic culture. But in the old days, like in San Francisco, when I joined, you know, everyone would just walk in off the street for the Sunday program. And we had no idea what their program was, but we get, we serve everyone prasadam. So yes, you may give prasadam to all your, your office mates without any concern for making an offense. Because how else Thank will they God. get purified? Yes. I just have one more question. Uh, when we are such in spiritual practice and um, we feel that elevated soul within us, why is it that um, we're so close to Krishna and Krishna loves us that why do we get dispositioned at some times in life, uh, not at the same level? Why do we, um, even in our consciousness, we know that Krishna is with us, but some vibration dips down and then you have to raise it back up. Why does that fluctuation happen with the true devotee who has good intentions? It's, it's because of the obstacles to steadiness. There are five obstacles to being steady, or nishta, nishta bhakti. And those obstacles are persistent because of my long association and becoming habitually engaged in them over many, many lifetimes. Everyone knows that it takes a while. I think it's apocryphal to say it takes 21 days to <laughs> make a new habit. It's more like 21 years. But... It takes a long time to develop a new habit or to give up an old bad one. You have to practice a lot. So we have bad habits in the material world and they're manifest in five major categories that have to do with sleep, distraction, not being interested in Krishna consciousness, and then innate 
uh, lustful propensities that ingrain themselves in the senses and within our uh, minds, deeply within our minds, the sense within. And the cleansing process takes some time and practice. Although we can feel our good intention within the heart, there's still a way in which we're battling with these five obstacles to steadiness. However, nashta prayeshu bhadreshu nityam bhagavata sevaya bhagavata yutama shloke bhaktir bhavati naishtiki. As you continue to practice by hearing Bhagavatam every day and dutifully chanting your rounds, then naturally those will subside almost to nil. And then they will become nil, and you'll you'll experience it. Tada rajas tamo bhava kama lubadayas che cheta itera navidam stitam sattve prasiddhi. Stitam means you'll be situated in in transcendental goodness. Sattva doesn't mean in this verse that it's the mode of goodness in the material world, the Shuddha Sattva. And then at that time, evam prasanna manaso bhagavad bhakti yogata. You'll feel for yourself that you're joyful, happy, and you'll know that you're steady and uh, untouchable by the uh, five obstacles because you've come to the stage of nishta, nishta, nishita bhakti. So we should try for that, take some practice. I think we have time Thanks. for one more question. Thank you, Maharaj. I just want to say your words are like a nectar to the soul, and we all need it, and we've missed you terribly. Uh, I will see you on Sunday. Hare okay, Krishna. Okay, I look forward to it. That's all Srila Prabhupada's mercy. We're just repeating. Hare Krishna. One last question. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Yes. <laughs> Is that I'm, I'm, Roman? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll be really quick. Uh, I was just uh, uh, listening about the past seven days of uh, Maharaj Parikshit, and uh, uh, I start to reflect those seven days on my life, and you regret a lot that you become in the Krishna consciousness on the half of your life, and you think, what is the rest of your life is those seven days of Maharaj Parikshit? So it means every day, every shloka that you hear, it means so important in your life that you have to concentrate, you know, every day because this could be your seven days of Maharad Parikshit. And it gives you a lot of stimulations to, you know, participate in all the uh, uh, spiritual activities. And that's really amazing. It makes your life much more different. And it's kind of a shield from the material world itself. Thank you, Maharaj, for your lecture. I love your point. It's really helpful. Thank you very much, Bhakti Roman. Okay, uh, last last for the morning is a Paragarangi. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for the reading session. So, in one of the purports, it was mentioned that by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, one becomes acquainted with the form of the Lord. Mm. So, would you like? Would you please elaborate what it really means? Nam, Rup, Guna, Lila. This is mentioned by um, Prahlad Maharaj. If you look at the end of the uh, first canto, fifth chapter, he mentions how there's a process we go through in the in the process. There's a process we go through in devotional service, step by step, through which the various aspects of the Lord are revealed. So we know that the name and form of Krishna are the same. Abhinatvam nam and namanamino. This is the statement of the Padma Purana from the famous verse, which says, Nama chintamani Krishna chaitanya rasa vigraha purna shudho nitya mukto binatvam abhinatvam. Namanamino, the name and the named are the same, no difference. So the, the form of the Lord is also present. Nam, Rup, Guna, Lila. And in succession, do you want to look at that verse? You give me the first canto. Uh, it's the last verse. One, five, last verse is somewhere like 34. Prahlad Maharaj mentions how uh, gradually you'll come to know all, Nam, Rup, Guna, Lila. So first the name, then you'll understand the form of the Lord, 
And that, how can you understand it? Krishna will reveal himself. You know, Atashi Krishna Namadi Nabhavet Grayam Indri Sevan Bukihi Jivado Swayam Eva Spurityada. So Spurati means that he'll reveal himself. If you start chanting, serving with your tongue, Spurati means he appears in your uh, mind's eye. He'll be available to you. And then um, in the 1539, yes, Imam Swanigamam Brahman Avetya Mad Anushtitam Adanme Gyanam Aishvaryam Swasmin Pavam Chikeshava. O Brahmana, thus by the Supreme Lord Krishna, I was endowed first with the transcendental knowledge of the Lord as inculcated in the confidential parts of the Vedas, then with the spiritual opulences, and then with his intimate loving service. This indicates various stages, and uh, everything unfolds step by step, as also mentioned in the verse, Satam prasangam mamavirya sambido bhavanti hrit karna rasayana kata taj joshanad asua pavargavartmani shradaratir Bhaktir Anukramishuti. Anukramishuti means step by step. So the, so the the form of the Lord becomes revealed. Then the Nam, Rup, Guna, the qualities, and Lila. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you know, like the qualities, Krishna's fragrance, you know, from the Anti Lila, when he's worshiping the Lord, then he smells the fragrance of Krishna's body and he can't get it out of his mind. You know, one of his qualities is there. And uh, pastimes of the Lord, we know, like from Valmiki Muni, he came to such a point of chanting Rama that he was able to envision the pastimes of the Lord as if he was in the same room. It was like he's watching the play in the room and he's just writing it all down. This is what happened next. Ramachandra stood behind the tree killed Vali, you know, all that stuff. He just saw it directly. So you'll come to see all that by the, the power of the chanting of the holy name. Nam, gu, nam rup guna lila. Well, uh, could we see the Zoom room again? Thank you very much, dear devotees. It's such a pleasure, isn't it, to be together and just hear Bhagavatam unrestrictedly. Hare Krishna, is that Shraddha? Shraddha Devi Dasi, Hari Bo. So thank you, everybody for coming, Chitraleka, Sakik, and uh, Devavrata. I can't see everybody. My, I think I'm going to need glasses or something besides these ones. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining today. And we'll pick it up tonight. We'll be back. Vansha Kaupada Bhrishcha, Kripa Sinabeva Cha, Patitanam, Pavani Bo, Vaishnava Bhyo, Namo Namaha, Nantakoti Vaishnava Ki Jai, Shumad Bhagavatam Ki Jai, Shukadev Goswami Ki Jai, Prikshit Maharaj Ki Jai, Katvanga Ki Jai, Gaur Premanandi Haribo. Haribo! Haribo!